بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ان دی نیم آف گاڈ المائٹی دی گریشیس دی مرسی فل ایز اے ٹریڈیشن وی اسٹارٹ اوور فنکشنز ود دی ریسٹیشن آف دی ہولی قرآن دی ورڈز آف دی گاڈ آئی ریکویسٹ مسٹر اختر حمید پلیز کم اینڈ ریسائٹ پورشن آف ہولی قرآن أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين تَنِبُوا كَثِيرًا مِنَ الزَّنِّ إِنَّ بَعْضَ الزَّنِّ إِسْمُ وَلَا تَجَسَّسُ وَلَا يَغْتَبْ بَعْضُكُمْ بَعْضَا عَيُهِبْ أحدكم أن يأكل لحم أخيه ميتا فكرهتموه واتقوا الله إن الله تواب رحيم يا أيها الناس إن خلقناكم من ذكر وأنسى وأنسى وجعلناكم شؤوبا وقبائل لتأعرفوا إن أكبر رَمَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ أَتْقَاكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ عَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ In the name of Allah, uh, the gracious and the good. O ye who believe, avoid most suspicion. Of suspicion, in some cases, is a sin. And spy not, nor backbite one another. Would any of you like to eat the flesh of your brother who is dead? Certainly you would loathe it and fear Allah. Surely Allah is off returning with compassion and is merciful. <coughs> o mankind, we have created you from a male and a female. We have made you into tribes and sub-tribes, and that you may recognize one another. Verily, the most honorable among you in the sight of Allah is he who is the most righteous amongst you. Surely Allah is all-knowing and all-aware. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce you our two speakers today. First of all, Pastor Sandy, he originates from Belfast and is married to Elizabeth. He has two children, Melissa and Oliver. He moved to Kilsyth to take up the leadership at Church of God in 2006. He enjoys reading, hill walking, and painting, having trained as an artist before he entered the ministry. He is passionate about community transformation, and his ethos in life is, find the best you can do today to change our life. Now, the, turning to the second speaker today, Imam Rashid, who has traveled from London to join us today. Imam Rashid is uh, <coughs> a well-known scholar within our community. He is the Imam of the London Mosque, which is the very first uh, mosque, purpose-built mosque, built in United Kingdom in 1924. 
Imam Sahib is a student of comparative religion. After completing his studies, he graduated from the University of Punjab and then proceeded to the Theological College of the Association to pursue further education in religious studies. Imam has always distinguished himself in his studies. He was awarded a gold medal for the Arabic language from the University of Punjab as a mark of his proficiency in the subject. His first posting for the association was here to the UK in 1971 to serve as Deputy Imam of the London Mosque. He returned to Pakistan two years later and was appointed as the President of the International Youth Organization of the movement, after which he was commissioned to our mission in Japan in 1975 as missionary in charge. And eight years later, he returned to our shores again, this time as missionary in charge UK and Imam of the London Mosque. Imam is a well versed in religious scripture, including the Bible and the Holy Quran. He is fluent in many languages including English, Urdu, Punjabi, Arabic, and Japanese. And it is my pleasure to present these speakers to you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to invite uh, respected Sandy McMeekin, this pastor church of God in this village, Kilsyth. Please come and deliver this speech. Well, first of all, I just want to say uh, thank you so much for the invitation to come to this peace conference and to speak today and to address uh, people as eminent as, as the scholar, Mr. Atu Ol Majib Rashid. Dr. Atu, of course, has become a friend, members of the Civic Council, ladies and gentlemen, and of course, members of Church of God here in Kilsang. First of all, I need to make an apology, and that is uh, almost immediately. Uh, we hit 6.45, 5.45 rather, I have to leave here for another engagement in Glasgow and so sadly I can't stay for uh, any questions and answers. When I looked at the subject uh, of a role of women in a peace society, um, I immediately saw four possible difficulties that uh, might spring to mind. The first is time, 10 minutes to speak on the role of women. I think it is a very, very uh, short space of time. Uh, secondly, sensitivity to the culture. There are differences, and I'm looking around today, and it's so good to see so many, many cultures here. Uh, in fact, uh, coming from Belfast and coming from the situation of uh, where we've known our own troubles, and then being here in Kulsaif, speaking to what is really an international community, you have to say, God really must have a sense of humor in doing that. Uh, but also, I think it's a bit presumptuous of me, a man, to talk to women and to talk about the role that women have in a peace society because as we shall see in a few seconds a lot about our theme uh, has uh, ramifications upon that. So I broke the theme down into four key areas. I broke the theme down into role, women, peace and society. Role is that thing which is prescribed or determined for us, a behaviour or a particular position. And women, uh, so therefore uh, uh, contra men in terms of gender and peace. Well, I read this quote, peace is a quality describing a society or a relationship that is operating harmoniously. And this is commonly understood as the absence of hostility or the existence of healthy or newly healed interpersonal or international relationships. I want you to hold that thought for a few seconds because I think that's got ramifications as well. And then fourthly, society. Well, society it tells me in the encyclopedia, is a group of people related to each other through persistent relations such as social status, roles, social networks, and by extension, society denotes the people of a region or country, sometimes even the world taken as a whole. So I see two implications from this, two difficult implications. The first implication is that women have a unique gender-defined role in society, and in particular, a society that's free from social moral, ethical, spiritual, sexual, relational, aspirational, and international conflict. Now, that was a bit of a mouthful, wasn't it? 
Second implication is that peaceful societies actually exist. What is a peaceful society? Well, I suppose if you were to take a comparison, and we could take many, many of the world's trouble spots, let's consider, for instance, the Middle East, and identify that as a non-peace society. And let's just, for argument's sake, identify here us in the UK and in sunny Kilsyth today. Let's identify us as a peace society. The only difficulty I have with that is this, that Glasgow as a city, I hear statistically, is the most violent city in the Western world. And speaking anecdotally, having been raised in Belfast, I can say anecdotally that certainly it seemed that the streets of Belfast were more peaceful during the Troubles than they are post the Troubles. It's intriguing, and maybe in Scotland you might not be aware of this, but although we had the Troubles and we had the sectarian divide, that equally the paramilitaries were very active in their own communities in dealing with what we would term antisocial uh, behaviour. If peace is harmony in society, then I want to say that a peace society doesn't exist. Substance abuse, sexual abuse, marital abuse, political abuse, injustice, unrighteousness, immorality and violence are as much a part of UK society as any other place on the face of the earth. And so to quote the Apollo 13 astronaut James Lovell when he said, Houston, we have a problem. So I want to try and rephrase the question, rephrase the theme and say it this way or ask the question this way. Rather than women, what is the role of humanity in creating a peace society? Well, my uh, eminent uh, co-speaker uh, will know that a Jewish rabbi once said these words, Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So let's explore that for a couple of seconds. First of all, faith. What is faith? Well, Irma McManus said this, We have been born curious. We are meaning machines. And we are on a search. Faith is the question of why. Faith is the question that asks, why is there immorality? Faith is the question of philosophy and religion. Why is there a conscience? Why is there evil? Why is there suffering in the world? It's intriguing to me that every, every world system, every world culture has some kind of belief system, both for the now and for what happens after the now. In other words, we are somehow inbuilt in all of us as a capacity to find meaning and substance in the world. And so this Jewish rabbi, he said, these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest is love. The first thing he says is this, that we are meaning machines. We are designed to want to find out the reason for the why of life. And yet faith, this rabbi said, is not the greatest. Well, second, he said that faith and then hope exists. What is hope? Hope is some kind of intangible desire that we have for the future. I'm not sure about you, but certainly I know that I plan to celebrate another birthday. I plan to go on another holiday. I plan to experience so many, many things in life. The only difficulty is all of those things exist in the future, and the future hasn't happened yet. It's interesting that we can survive without almost anything. We can endure almost any kind of inhumanity and suffering and danger. I remember when I was growing up as a child in Belfast and when the troubles first started and our town and city began to polarize. I can remember as a young boy having to lie on the floor of my uh, house as gunmen were shooting from one house to the other. And you would think that in a context like Belfast and Northern Ireland, where there was hopelessness, it seemed on the face of it, that actually hung, hope sprung eternal. And it's interesting, we can deal with the, with the presence of almost anything, but we can't survive without hope. And yet hope is not the greatest. For this Jewish rabbi said, faith, hope exist, but the greatest is love. The Beatles sang, you can't buy me love. Howard Jones asked the question, what is love? Well, the Bible tells us this, that the greatest love is that one man lay down his life for another. We are created to give love and to receive love. We are created to have faith and to find meaning. We are created to have hope. And you know, Jesus said this, that the greatest commandment is this, to love God, to love your neighbor, to love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. One goes vertical 
and the other goes horizontal. And here we are today in a peace society asking the question, uh, how can we go horizontal with each other? How can we create the sense of understanding and faith and harmony to get this society that we all want? I think it's ironic that in a so-called peace society, in a, in a country like Scotland in the 21st century, that not thousands of miles away, not even hundreds of miles away, but yet here on our doorstep, there exists a society where there is no hope, where there is no faith, where there is no love. There are thousands of loveless, faithless, hopeless people in Kilseth tonight who are abusing themselves with substances because they have no faith, they have no hope, and they have no love. It's ironic that a peace society is not a society that's devoid of peace. It's not a society that's devoid of poverty. It's a society that's filled by faith, hope, and love. So back to our question. What is the role of a woman in a peace society? Well, let me break it down into four key themes. The first theme is title. A title. A title that a Jewish rabbi 2,000 years ago had conferred upon him. The Prince of Peace. I think it's ironic that we will look for peace everywhere except in the person in whom peace resides. Secondly, a title. Secondly, a purpose. Jesus, the Bible tells us, came to bring peace on the earth. What is the message of Christmas? Peace and goodwill toward who? Toward all men who are on the face of the earth. Not just Christians. Not just the, those who are in the faith. But Jesus came to bring peace toward all men. The third word I want to put, uh, put towards you today is role. And the role I want to say is this. The role is the same for men as it is for women. Because that Jewish rabbi, the Apostle Paul, said this. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Jesus Christ. So what do we learn about women in the Bible? Well, women in the Bible were the first evangelists. In the Old Testament, they were part of the patriarchal system. We think of people like Sarah and Rebecca. We think of great women like Ruth and Esther, who was raised for such a time as this. We think about Mary, who was the mother of Jesus. We think about the women who were the first evangelists. In a society that demeaned women, Jesus gave dignity to women. And so what's the role of a woman today in the 21st century? Simply this, bring faith, bring hope, bring love to every single person you touch. Change one life at a time. And how do you do that? Well, you could do that as a mother, you could do that as a wife, but you could do that as an artist, you could do that as a teacher, you could do it as a homemaker, you can do it as a singer or a great business entrepreneur, you can do it as a politician, dare I say it, you could even without mentioning her name, do it as a prime minister, you could do it as a counsellor. A woman can do absolutely everything and anything that she wants to do today and bring faith and hope and love and create a better society for us all. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. No, I would like to invite uh, respected uh, Tawal Mujib Rashid Saab. He is Imam of London, as you have heard in his introduction. I would like to invite him to come and deliver his speech. <coughs> أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا نبده ورسوله أما بعد فأعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious ever merciful Respected ladies and gentlemen, the subject uh, in hand today is a very interesting subject as we have just listened, the role of women in a peaceful society. Just before me, you have listened to the Christian point of view regarding this very important subject and now it's my turn to present some thoughts from Islamic point of view. Just before me, Reverend Andy was 
uh, mentioning that uh, on the subject about women, perhaps uh, women should be the speaker as well and presenting their own case. <coughs> but uh, I would like to say that is it not more comfortable and more dignified for ladies that men are fighting on their behalf and men are presenting and advocating their rights. So it is not for the ladies to come uh, in the forefront and to battle and to struggle for their own rights when there are some people who are very proud and happy to defend their case and to present their point of view in the audience. <clears throat> well, the subject uh, which is uh, presented today is very interesting, very controversial, and very probing subject as well. From Islamic point of view, if I have to say that there are a lot of misunderstandings about the status and the role of women so far as Islam is concerned. Because people have not really got the full information about what Islam has said. And moreover, because of a lack of practice in some so-called Muslim countries and some sections of Muslim society, these people, they know that perhaps Islam does not treat women in the right way. And women are not given the right status and they are not allowed to play their role which they are supposed to play for the establishment of a peaceful society. In brief, I can say that from Islamic point of view, both men and women, they are treated absolutely equal. This equality concept in Islam is a very unique one. It is not a physical equality. It is not a material equality. It is not an apparent equality as you might be thinking in every way. As a matter of fact, in the whole world, there are not two identical people who are exactly like one another not even men, not even women. So how can you see that men and women should be looking equal, identical? Not like that. So physical equality is not the subject presented by Islam. But in a very sublime way, I would say that the equality in the spiritual field, <coughs> that is what Islam has presented. Both men and women, they have been created by God. They have been biologically created differently. But the role that they have to play for the establishment of peace in society and to promote it further and to strengthen it, that is equally applicable to both of them. They are created from a single soul. Their status is equal. Their responsibilities are equal. And their reward is also equal. And if, God forbid, they fail in their duties, then their questioning will be equally uh, strict upon them. So in every way, Islam has presented an equal status, an equal status for both men and women in the sight of God. And that is something which is very unique and special for Islamic teachings. So far as their role is concerned, in a brief way, I would say that it's quite simple, that peace is the ultimate objective of the whole of mankind. Every member of every society, of every culture, of every religion, they have to work hard to establish peace. First to establish peace, then to promote it, and then to strengthen, and then to share it with all the people of the rest, uh, rest of the people in society. So in that role, in that objective, the role that m men have to play, that is exactly equal as the ladies have to play. Because ladies are the part of the family on the equal basis with men. Islam has designed the whole world like this, that there is a feeling of inclination in men and women towards one another. And Islam says that this desire, which has been actually created by God, our creator, it should be satisfied in a dignified and honorable way. Not like this, as we see in some societies, that people just go and be in contact with the opposite member of the opposite sex. They try to enjoy for themselves without taking any responsibility upon them and then leaving the rest, whatever it may happen at the end of that. That is a very irresponsible way of uh, pleasing yourself at the cost of sometime very big uh, struggle and very big trial for the other, other person. What Islam says is very simple. In a society, both men and women, 
they should get into the bond of marriage and that will how they will establish a unit in the society a family will be created there through husband and wife they are going to be blessed with children so then the role of both men and women the husband and the wife the father and the mother that will come into play and islam says that first you take care of yourself be very honest be very faithful to one another and set a good example for the children to come and when you are blessed with children then you take care of their training and their education and guidance otherwise if you are too much obsessed with your work with your overtime with your extra business running after wealth then who is going to look after the children so that is where the role of the ladies come in particular that in order to create a peace loving community the role of the mother is very vital and very important i say so not meaning in any way that the role of the father is no uh, is no longer there the role of the mother father is also there but the role of the mother as women is much more stronger and much longer and much more productive by that i mean to say that the children when they are born they are naturally attached to the mothers they spend most of their time particularly in early years in close proximity with the mother and it is the mother who is going to shape the destiny or the future of their coming children and the children today are going to be the leaders of tomorrow so the one who is shaping the children in a peaceful people in a community of peaceful people then that lady is definitely performing a very vital role and that is where it is so important according to islam that the ladies the wives in the family they must first of all become peaceful themselves they must be the moral of a high moral standard example of the high moral standard they must be a paragon of virtue and they must be setting a good example for their children so that they can educate and train their children to become a peaceful citizen of the society so that is where the role of the ladies in a peaceful society not only in a society which is already peaceful but in a society which is not peaceful how to make that society a peaceful society and then to promote it further so the role of ladies is very important because the very first place of education for a child is the home in islam this is recognized very clearly children go to school but not on the very first day so much so islam says that even the education of the children it begins even before their birth that is why islam says that before you lay the foundation stone of the family before the conjugal relationship is there even that moment both the husband and the wife they should pray to god and when the children are born even before their birth they should be praying for a pious progeny when they are born immediately they should start taking care of those children so that care of children that is more appropriately taken by the mother that is how i say why i say that in islam the role of women in shaping a peaceful society is much more vital and much more important according to the teachings of islam having said all these things let me now take to another points as well that islam also says that uh, men and women as they are equal in status equal in responsibility equal in reward in the sight of god almighty therefore islam has given such teachings which are most suited and most appropriate to the conditions in which men and women they live their life the rules and the regulations concerning so many aspects of human life they are given in such a way by god almighty in the holy quran that one can see that islam has presented that god which is not only knowledgeable about everything rather he knows everything but is coming in future and that god almighty is the fountain head of wisdom so based on these qualities the teachings of islam have been given in relation to men and women on an equal basis so if from that angle i just want to share with you some of the points for example in the worship islam says it is a responsibility both upon men and women equally the islamic prayer five times a day that is obligatory for both men and women because as men are need of spirituality 
so are the women because they are going to be the mother of their future generation so they have to be really the ladies which are the model in spirituality in family life islam says you have to go for a division of work so far as earning of livelihood is concerned men have to go outside as a matter of duty as a part of their responsibility of course ladies can also work if situation demands but not without that because the more important area which i have already mentioned taking care of the children that is on their hand regarding the marriage it is another another issue in our family life islam says that both men and women they are equally entitled to take the decision of their marriage it is wrong if anybody has this idea that in islam arranged marriages are there which means that cut and dry decisions are made by the parents or other people and they are imposed on their daughters it is not the way in islam both have to express their opinion and agree to it and only then the marriage can take place not without that and similarly if god forbid after the marriage there is an occasion a time comes when they cannot pull together amicably peacefully then in that case the right of divorcing a right of separation that is equally given to men and to the uh, women the husband and the wife they equally have the same right as given no discrimination at all moreover islam has emphasized that in the relationship of marriage the question of chastity is something very important before the marriage after the marriage i mean in every respect the question of chastity and purity must always be upheld by both the partners so islam does not approve of any physical contact between grown up people unrelated people uh, outside the wedlock islam says that is not permissible when the occasion comes when you feel like that when circumstances permit then you go for marriage which is the dignified and time old way of satisfying your desire and after the marriage again islam says that going outside that uh, restricted relationship having relationship or affair with somebody else that is totally unacceptable in the teachings of islam the husband must be loyal to the wife and the wife must be loyal to the husband that loyalty chastity is actually one of the most beautiful teachings which is emphasized in islam then islam has also advised the muslim lady that they have to take particular care about their clothes about their going out about their mixing with people so that they should not be inviting unnecessary attention or the interest of those people who are not related to them because sometime in such cases such event eventualities happen which people feel very sorry later on but then perhaps it is too late so islam says the care has to be taken from the very beginning instead of crying later on regarding education islam has given equal rights to men and women this is a basic obligation both upon men and women islam says islam also has given the right of inheritance to ladies i mean in many cultures in many religions in many societies this is not recognized even today but islam has laid the foundation of that that islam ladies also have the right in an inheritance the right of ownership is also given to the ladies they can be the owner of property of the wealth rather at the time of the occasion of marriage there is a dower money a amount of a dowry which is announced from the husband to be given as a personal gift to the wife and that is actually like putting the first brick of the ownership of the i mean the right of ownership in case in favor of the ladies and moreover the ladies also have the right of witness so in every way islam has mentioned both of them equally and the role that they have to play in everything including the role for the est establishment of peaceful society that is absolutely equal ladies and gentlemen before i close the last point i want to say is that islam in order to establish peace and harmony between husband and wife has given us a golden principle and that is that the men have been strongly enjoined that they should be very very nice and very courteous very dignified in their behavior to their wives there is a statement of the holy prophet of islam which i would like to mention at the end where he says khairukum khairukum li ahlihi wa ana khairukum li ahlihi that addressing the men he said 
that the best among you is he who is best in his treatment to his wife. And that was not the end of the sermon. He added that look at my example. As a prophet of God, I am standing before you. The holy prophet of Islam said that look at my example. I am the best so far as my treatment to my wife is concerned. So that example was given by the holy prophet of Islam and that was a golden lesson for establishing a very peaceful and harmonious married life. And if the family in each family becomes a peaceful family, then you can imagine peace will be everywhere in that locality, in that city, in that town, in that country, all over the world. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Now this is the time for the question answer session. Uh, you can ask uh, the organizer to provide you microphone if you want to ask the question verbally. Or you can have got, you have got the piece of papers. You can send the your question in written form. Um, I have a I have a question uh, about uh, gays and lesbians in an Islamic society. Uh, what is the what is the point of view? Um, uh, from an Islamic point of view of uh, gays and lesbians, what rights do, do they have in, a, in an Islamic society, if any? Well, uh, as I mentioned while talking about the institution of marriage, that this is the right way, according to Islam, to satisfy one's desire. There is nothing wrong with this desire, because this has been created by God. But the same God who created the desire, he also gave us clear indication as to what is the way out. And that is the marriage and no other way. Because marriage is something which is actually the real way of continuing the progeny. And any other way, like the one you have pointed out, gays and lesbians, that is not the way in which the progeny could continue. That is a way where they sidetrack the divine plan of things and try to go for their selfish enjoyment without taking any responsibility on their shoulder. So that is something which is not approved in the teachings of Islam because it runs contrary to the way as the creator has made human beings. If that is the case, why the whole system of reproduction has been created in men and women? The question arises, if people have to sidetrack this and bypass it and try to get their selfish desire satisfied, then in a way they are ignoring, they are bypassing, they are rejecting that divine system of creation which God Almighty has given there. So Islam says it is something like that as the people of Lot did. They also did the same thing. Instead of getting married and satisfying their desire, which is the natural way of satisfaction, ordained by God Almighty, they decided to go out of the way and follow whatever they used to do at that time, everyone knows. But then we have to see what was the reaction and what was the answer by God Almighty. Did God Almighty let these people flourish? No, it was not. God Almighty intervened there and the people, they were destroyed. Their whole township of Sodom and Gomorrah they were completely eliminated from the surface of the earth. This divine intervention clearly indicates that any sexual activity outside the domain of the legalized, religiously established way of marriage, that is something which is against the laws of nature and God Almighty does not approve that one. So that is my simple answer to this question. You know, my opinion isn't the important opinion. I think the important opinion is to ask God himself. Um, I spoke about faith, hope and love and what I would also add to that is that Christianity and Christians down through the years have got themselves a very, very bad press um, from extreme um, opinions and versions and it could be almost at times labelled uh, homophobic. I think statistically at the last census, something like 1% of the, the population identified themselves as gay lesbian, which is a very, very small percentage. And of that 1%, um, as equally as we have within Christianity certain elements who would be very hardline 
there was a very active pro-gay lobbying that I think the vast uh, majority of homosexual uh, people would actually like to disassociate themselves from as well. I think most people in life just want to live life and go on with life. But secondly, there are questions as to why people choose um, certain lifestyles. And of course, I don't want to get into the debate, is it nurture or is it nature? But what I would say is this, is that God loves everybody, absolutely everybody on the face of the earth. God sent the Son, Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us in John 3.16, because he loved the whole world. And he just wants to see faith, hope, and love in every person that's made in his image. And so I think my opinion is an important one. I think the opinion of God the Father is the important one, and you can find that in his word. And I would just say to anybody, whether gay, lesbian, heterosexual, or whatever, don't just take my opinion, but find the opinion of the, of the Creator and see what He says. I, I would like very much to compliment such a wonderful conference and thank you for bringing the conference to Kilsyth where we can have such an open discussion. But it seems apparent when Sandy speaks ideally and our learned friend of the Islam, he speaks well as well. And in an ideal world, it would be wonderful. But it's anything but an ideal world. Christianity is not an ideal. The ideals in Christianity are wonderful. The ideals in Islam are wonderful. But it's a very, very divided world and a very sinful world. Now, to me, I'm a Christian and very happy with the knowledge and the growing faith of Jesus Christ because I believe that he has forgiven me and he forgives mankind. I feel sadly in the Islam tradition that the forgiveness is not often demonstrated in Islam to their sinful community. You take the rights of women, which is supposed to be the main subject, you know, but unhappily in Islam's world, when women step aside, they seem to be particularly victimized, ostracized, and very much punished. In the Christian world, the ladies are perhaps much more sinful, but they are all forgiven. And that seems to be the big difference between our two communities, the community of Islam and the community of Christianity. As a Christian, I know and I believe that we are forgiven. And I feel that Islam, the message of forgiveness, doesn't seem to come across. Thank you very much. I request uh, Mr. Sandy <coughs> McMee can please answer the question. Yeah, I'd like to come back to that. We live in a world of generalisms, and you've spoken about Christianity and Islam. And of course, you may be aware that in Islam, there is not just one uh, branch of Islam. I can think of at least the Sunnis, the Sufis, and the Shias, and our, our mm -hmm. uh, and respected friends here today, uh, which personally I've never come across until I met Dr. Atza. I also want to speak uh, with reference to Christianity, because historically, Christianity um, is, has been equally as intolerant in many regards. But I also want to um, want to nail the myth about religion being the root of all wars and, uh, and conflicts. Speaking from my own personal experience from Northern Ireland, it was always perceived that the conflict in Northern Ireland was always religious. It was never religious. It was political, but it, it was political within religious divides. But it's easier to put into a press report uh, that a uh, uh, an incident has occurred out of relig religious intolerance as opposed to a political ideology. And so down through the years, I have to say that Christians have sometimes been the worst self-publicists, I think, of the Crusades, for, for example. Um, it seems to me that if we really are Christians and we follow Jesus Christ, then we will be different. And if we live out the practice of following him, then not only will we be different, but we will make a difference. Jesus said this. He said, who's the wise man? The wise man is he who hears these words of mine. And as Christians, we're happy to hear his words. But the second part is and puts them into practice. And it's the putting into practice 
and you've mentioned forgiveness and, and uh, so on. We also have to take into account that we're talking today about faiths, that, uh, especially within the, the realm of Islam, um, is very much tied to the culture. And our cultures are very, very different. I ministered for 11 years in West Bromwich, which was a very, very multicultural um, town. And I personally enjoyed it, learning about the different cultures. And cultures are really, really different. And we have to take into consideration cultural context. In Christianity, um, you become a Christian, but you remain a Scotsman or an Irishman or, a, or whatever. But within Islam, and Islam may be an Indian, but an Indian may be a, 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 a Muslim. An Arab may be a Muslim, but the Arab is still a Muslim. In other words, the culture is part of the overall package, and we have to understand that cultures are slightly different. And so for me, uh, coming back again to what I said at the start, as Christians, let's just follow Jesus and enjoy the journey and see what God uh, unfolds. You know, I, I believe in, um, and I'm going to talk philosophically, and I believe in truth, and truth is an absolute. And so if truth is an absolute, there's right and wrong, and there's true and untrue. So let's all get on this quest of faith, hope, and love that God's placed in every single one of us and discover the truth. And in doing that, then the truth is what uh, brings us to this, this so-called better and peaceful society. Thank you very much, Shanti. I would like to request Imam Saab to give his point of view on the question. Uh, well, the question is uh, really very involved and very enlarged. He started from one point and then he uh, introduced some other points as well. But I think if basically the question is of forgiveness, I would like to say that Islam has uh, spoken quite extensively on the subject. One thing is that human beings are given a full chance of being going to the right side or to the left side. The choice is given to them. God says this is the right way to follow, this is the wrong way you have to avoid. You have been given the wisdom, you have got the choice, you have to make the right judgment. But then God says that if, according to Islam, somebody has done something wrong, then God Almighty gives the promise that you come to me. I will forgive your sins. And even if your sins are like, as they say, Himalayas, and you, should, you feel like being disappointed, that how can I be forgiven? God Almighty says, Inna Allaha yakfur zunuba jamia, that Allah Almighty forgives all the sins. The only condition is, people should truly repent to God Almighty. But now the question comes that people may say that, well, we are satisfied, we are happy, our sins are forgiven, we have been uh, completely got the salvation. But the question is that after salvation and forgiveness, there should be a reformation in that person and reformation in the society at, at large. But if we see that reformation and as a result of that uh, forgiveness is there, it is claimed, but the reformation is not there, then of course that cannot be a right statement of the fact. Look at the society today. Some people may say that, well, by following a certain faith, our sins have been forgiven. If their sins have been forgiven, but what about the other people? If the whole community has been forgiven, then the community should have become a better community. There must be some visible signs of change in the whole society. But what we see today that the sin is in, on the increase. People are increasing their sins. More and more heights of sins are being achieved. And people are going down the drain, as they say. And so therefore, simply to say that uh, uh, this has been forgiven, that is, uh, it may be said by some people, and individually it may be right. I don't deny that one. But collectively to say that the sins have been forgiven of a certain community, of certain people who have this idea, and as we see in the society, in the same society, when the sin is so rampant, how can <coughs> that sin be forgiven? Coming back to Islamic point of view, the forgiveness of the sin. God Almighty says that uh, people should forgive the lapses and shortcomings and faults of their fellow beings, giving the reason that don't you yourself expect that your sins should be forgiven by God? If on the day of judgment you want to be forgiven, then you be very kind and generous among the people and forgive their overdoings or any mistake that they might have committed. Another point is that in Islam there is a concept of uh, a hell and heaven, or I should say heaven and hell, that is the right way of saying it. The same is in Christianity, I know. But Islam has given a very wonderful point there, 
that while the state of heaven which is a state of nearness and closeness to God where people will be given all the blessings from God that is going to be eternal never ever ending at all because once the people are forgiven by God they are <coughs> entered into heaven then they will simply increase in their nearness to God Almighty and that blessing will never ever be taken away from them on the other side <coughs> Islam has given the teaching that if people are condemned to hell for their sins for which they have not sought forgiveness during their lifetime they continue to do the sin and they died in that state then they deserve to be punished for that but again God Almighty says in the Holy Quran that this punishment in hell is not going to be eternal it is going to be finishing one day that is the teaching of Islam and it is very much close and compatible with the concept of a gracious merciful and loving mm -hmm. God I mean if God is loving everybody says God is loving God is love so if God is love then that loving God should not punish anybody for limited sin into unlimited punishment if a person suppose has been committing uh, has been living for hundred years and all hundred years are full of sin suppose still there his sins will be are going to be limited to hundred years so how come that after that limited sin if a person goes to the hell the punishment should be unlimited God Almighty is gracious he is merciful he is very kind to the people so that gracious and loving God should put <coughs> the person for the punishment because he deserves that but unlimited punishment for limited sin is something which contradicts with the concept of a loving and gracious God so in Islam the teaching is that whatever the sin may be, have been committed one day will come when all the people from hell they will come out and become the recipient of the love and the mercy of God Almighty well it can be said more but I think we should uh, make room for other questions as well so with due apologize uh, I am going to change the order of the question as I have received uh, because uh, Mr. Sandy is uh, I want to leave earlier but this question is particular is asked from him the question is I would like to ask that to what extent a woman can go in spirituality <coughs> in Christianity e.g. a pope or a prophet can be a woman accordingly according to the Christian I'm not really sure about the last part of the question, e.g. a pop or prophet can be a woman according to Christians. Um, okay. I think what you're asking is can you be a Christian? Very int intriguing that um, our learned friend has raised the whole issue of sin and justification uh, for sins and this I don't think is the place to deal with that. I would have a totally a different opinion on uh, what's been shared a couple of seconds ago. But I think the question is, can you be a woman, or for that matter a man, I think, why, why man or woman, and go into what would on the, the face of it be a very sinful environment, e.g. the pop music industry, and influence that environment, uh, perhaps as a prophet um, or whatever. Um, a long, long time ago, uh, there was a, uh, before uh, modern day Iraq and Iran, there was a a civilization that was ruled by the Babylonian Empire and a young uh, Hebrew slave scholar was taken as a slave to um, Babylon and he served our uh, very famous king called King Nebuchadnezzar and he became the chief of the astrologers um, within that context. Now his name is Daniel and he was a Hebrew. He's a follower of God and a prophet of God and yet within the Babylonian um, Empire he became one of the chief astrologers now, of course, astrology is completely antithesis to Christianity, and yet this Hebrew scholar uh, and prophet rose to the very cream of the crop of his generation in a far-off country. The issue is not how far can you go into a sinful world. The issue is how strong is the salt in the presence of Jesus Christ that you, can, that you possess. The whole point of being a Christian is that we're salt and light, not in church, because that's a bit like being a, a salt in a salt cellar, but salt in a an assault cellar really is no purpose or no value if it doesn't get put into the meat or the stew to flavor it or to savor it. And as 
followers of Jesus Christ, we are the salt and the light of the earth. And so, is this making kind of a funny noise? Is it okay? Yeah. Sorry, I just keep hearing this kind of noise in, in uh, my ear. Every day, we live in a sinful world. The, the world is just, as you've just uh, quite correctly identified, it's a sinful place, but then we ourselves are prone to sin. So can a Christian be uh, a Christian and a prophet or an influencer in the world? Well, of course, that's exactly what Christ called us to be. We are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And if your talent is a talent in music and God makes you, God forbid, the Cliff Richard of the 21st century, um, but if you become the, the prime... I'm sorry if that offends a certain uh, age group, by the way. I'm sure you, Cliff was a good guy in his day and, but, and so on. But listen... Can you be a Christian and a politician? Uh, can you be a Christian and a lawyer? Can you be a Christian and a teacher? Can you be a Christian and a mother or a father? Absolutely yes. Can you be a Christian and a prime minister? I would love it to be the case uh, totally and fully. Of course, the issue is not the world. The issue is the God who is in you. We're sent not to be influenced by the world, but to influence the world. And Christ in us is a transforming power. And so whoever asked that question, if you sense that you have an ability in pop music, but you want to serve God in the pop music industry, listen, the pop music industry needs Jesus Christ every bit as much as the good people of Kilsyth need Jesus Christ. I am sorry, but I have to apologize. I have to go now, but could I make a suggestion, if that's okay, uh, to the chair? There's a very eminent video uh, presenter and historian in our midst today. And I would love it if, Jim, if you could come and take this chair and address any further uh, questions on behalf of the Christian side. Would that be okay? Can I suggest that? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jim. <coughs> thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I will repeat the <coughs> question. It's a very interesting question. The question is, I would like to ask that to what extent a woman can go in spirituality, in Christianity, e.g. a pope or a prophet can be a woman according to Christians. But they will, will ask the question from Imam Saab according to Islamic point of view. Uh, yes, uh, it's a very interesting question. And uh, obviously the question of being pope is not applicable to Islam but uh, other aspects may be there. Basically, I would say that uh, the status of a woman, it can go to any height in spirituality uh, to in whatever extent God Almighty has specified it. Because basically, if the rules of the Islam are such that ladies are responsible for the same act of worship, so then the reward of the worship, submission to God, should also be there. And the reward of submission, uh, rewards of uh, worship, they end in spirituality. So the status of a woman can also rise in spirituality depending on the worship that she performs. But coming to this question more precisely, the question may be asked, or sometime it is asked in this way, that uh, do we have the be belief that a woman can also be nominated or elected as a prophet? So the answer to that has been given in God Almighty, in the Holy Quran by God Almighty, that it has been that way. God Almighty, the Creator, has ordained this way that always men have been chosen to become uh, the role model in the capacity of a prophet for mankind. And there is a profound wisdom in that one because all the teachings, as I mentioned in my submission earlier on, they are based on points of wisdom. What is the wisdom in that one? Because the ladies, I mean, if the lady is appointed as the prophet, then would anybody say that then such a lady should not get married? Because that lady is a prophet, so he should not get married to carry out the duties. So then one principal teaching of Islam will be violated there. And if the lady gets married, then she will also become pregnant. She would also become mother. She would also have to look after the children after the birth feeding the children, all these things. So how can that lady continue to make herself available to be the guide of the mosses as the, as the role model for them? She won't be available. So in that case, she won't be able to do justice to the responsibility of a prophet. 
So these are, and some others are the reasons why God Almighty has mentioned like this that always it has been the case the decision is in the hand of God. It is not a people to aspire to become prophet. It is not for the ladies to say that well someone of us should be made or exalted to the prophethood. But it is the decision of the creator because a nomination of the prophet is in the hand of God. But there is one thing very interesting which some people sometimes ask that is it possible that uh, the Muslim ladies can become the leader in prayer? The prayer in congregation is offered. That is one way of Islamic way of prayer. So can a lady be the leader of the congregation? That is also a status of spirituality. The answer is yes. A lady can become the leader of the congregation. The only condition would be that all the congregation should be composed of ladies. And many a time it happens in our community. When the ladies have their gatherings, all ladies are there and the time for congregational prayer comes, then one of the lady becomes their leader, the spiritual leader, head of that uh, congregation, and she leads the prayer in the same way as the men would lead. So the lady would be leading to the ladies. So she can become the leader like that. So all these things are there. And it is, uh, moreover, I would like to mention that the concept of a prophet in Islam and Christianity, I feel it is a different one. Because one thing very outstanding is mentioned there, according to Islam, we believe that prophet is someone who does not make a mistake. He is protected by God and he does not do anything which has been prohibited by God. So that is to say he does not commit a sin. So anything which is a sin can never be attributed to a person who is known as a prophet of God. So this is the high status of the prophethood which is mentioned in Islam and I think it is different in so many ways. So this is uh, the brief answer to my comment on this question that the ladies can go to all these stages of spirituality with the clarification that I have given. Thank you, Imam Sahib. The next question is based on what we have just been told, why is it that the Western society still view on and assume that Islamic women are inferior to men? Well, I think uh, the answer would be, uh, first of all, lack of information. Because if information is not available, if people have not read, if people have not listened, if they do not have any access to the true teachings of Islam as contained in the Holy Quran or as demonstrated by the Holy Prophet of Islam, so then their image, their understanding and their realization of Islam would be very much defective. They won't know what is Islam. And as uh, without the knowledge of the true uh, information, without the true information, they, uh, their understanding of Islam will also be defective. So they would continue to believe as if they are, uh, you know, the, the ladies in Islamic societies, they are considered to be a lower member of the society. Another reason could be that unfortunately, as I briefly mentioned, that in some sections of Islamic society, or I should say so-called Islamic society, the treatment of ladies is unfortunately not in accordance with the teachings of Islam. It is not only the case in Islam that such a, a situation happens there. I mean, in every society, in every religion, you will definitely come across some people somewhere who do not follow their own religion so meticulously as they should be. So if the example of a defaulter is picked up in Christian Christianity, for example, and somebody says, look, as that man being a Christian is not doing like that, therefore the whole Christianity is to blame, that would be wrong. That will never ever be a right judgment to make. Similarly, if people see something happening somewhere in a certain country, in Afghanistan, in Iran, in Pakistan, or in Saudi Arabia, or in Taliban, or you know, other people, if they do something wrong, and they do many things, by the way, they do many things wrong, so if they do wrong things, and people say that, well, if they are doing it, that is the teaching of Islam. That is actually the fault of those people who make the wrong judgment. Because decisions about religion, they must be based on their scriptures or on their role models, which is the prophet of God. So if the teaching is not there, the example of the role model is not there to support that, how can that thing can be attributed to Islam? 
so if mistreatment of ladies is witnessed in some countries i agree with that i i i agree to this point that mistreatment is done there but mistreatment those who do and those who are responsible for that they are violating the teachings of their own religion so that does not mean that the religion should be blamed for that one it does not try point make any point against islam it does make a point against those people who violate the violate the teachings of their own religion so they are to be blamed not islam like that so if the people in the western society because they depend on the information coming to them through media through television through print media and others i mean they simply say this is an islamic country this is the bad treatment being done to the ladies over there and naturally they come to the conclusion as if islam means that that is wrong they should always go for the teachings of islam as contained in the holy quran and they should find out what is the example of the role model the holy prophet of islam in this regard if anything contrary to that is done there that is the doings of those defaulters and these defaulters in my opinion do not have the right to be taken as the ambassadors of islam thanks um and what uh, the roles that women play in religion a way back you know i'm catholic but a way back when my mum and dad were married um was these the men were always the dominant party they were always the dominant the women done all the housework looked after the kids as you see the men went out to work came back and the clothes all washed everything had to be done rules were rules kids were to be seen not heard but then we grew up and we took responsibility because i feel yes this world's equal and as god and jesus said we're all equal in their eyes he died for our sins to give us you know freedom so i take it that women are all equal across every religion every woman is equal and more equal to men now i think both uh, religions share the same views um but why why are each uh, religions islam and christians having different ways of life and if there's if they all share practically the same goals of peace and love and faith and hope then then why is there two different religions and and what is the the, the difference between the two of them exactly well i think if you look uh, at the situation you would find that going back to old testament times you go back to the time of abraham <coughs> isaac jacob many of the old testament prophets there is tremendous similarity between the base of the islamic religion the christian religion indeed the jewish religion many of the prophets that we honor in christianity uh, are very much honored in islam and if i was to speak about many instances which are related in our old testament of our bible uh, i they would find tremendous common place in that uh, so i think there are tremendous uh, similarities in our faiths we've got to be very clear about it if you're a very strong christian as i am i believe very firmly in the christian faith and there are many friends who are very strongly committed to the islamic faith but there are tremendous similarities one of the big difficulties we have is that we very often get entrenched in a situation where we don't want to meet each other to discuss things sandy spoke about uh, an incident that we talked about in the christian faith of salt and light 40 years ago us sat beside the sea of galilee with a group of people who were uh, some were christians some were palestinian muslims some were jewish and we were looking across the other side of the of the sea and there was flashing lights of fighting going on up in the up in the hills there and we were taking a our food there just cooking fish and one of the people quoted from the bible and said jesus said sitting here that you are the light of the world a city set in a hill cannot be hidden see that has that city of safed up there you'll never be lost if you look up there because that city is there you're the salt of the earth but eating fish that are kept preserved by salt and that's affected me for 40 years because much as i love my church and i'm sure many of the people here who are of the islamic faith love their laws if we just draw up and only stay there and don't get involved in the communities we share our faith share that there's this division and much of what happens is that we don't understand each other we don't uh, share faith with each other i worked in schools for years 
it's important that you get in and actually share things. We are the salt of that. We're the light of the world. We've got to be in the communities. Very easy for me to stand and preach in a church or any other place. Very difficult to be out and involved. So we've lots in common, but there are differences. And we've got to be honest with the differences and share these in an honest way so we can progress. Uh, yes, I think uh, I would agree to most of the things just mentioned there, starting from the point that uh, there is no doubt there is a lot of similarities between Islam and not only Christianity but uh, Judaism and uh, some other previous religions as well. But uh, this thing has never come to me as a surprise. Some people are surprised. I have been speaking in various uh, parts of the country. When I go for speaking, many a time people come to me, they say, well, this is very much similar to what I believe. I believe in a different religion, but it is very much similar to what we have said. It never comes to me as a matter of surprise. Because I believe, and that is the Islamic belief as a matter of fact, that all religions, they have been originated from one God. If one God is the fountainhead of all the religions, how is it possible that the same God should be teaching something different in the past and teaching us something different today? If God is one, the fountainhead is one, then the message should also be basically one and similar to one another. And that is the case. For example, we believe in absolute unity of God. Absolutely God is one. There is no question of second, third, fourth or fifth God. No such question is there. But belief in God is there. That common theme is to be seen in all the religions. But the understanding of God is different according to the people and other attributes of God may also be different. But basic idea is the same. Then submission to God is again a point which is given everywhere. In all religions they say you listen to God and submit to that one because that is the way of salvation. So similarities are there, no doubt. And that has to be that way. Otherwise, we cannot uh, you know, uh, reconcile this difference, uh, this similarity, why it is like that. But having said all that, points of differences are also there, as it is mentioned there. So differences are there because of the lapse of time, because of the change in their books of guidance. Sometimes there are different situations happening there. Interpretation could be different. People take it in different way. Some people forget, some not. So, so many things happen there. So, differences are there. And moreover, the teachings in previous religions to Islam, we believe that was given according to the need and the requirement of the situation. It was not given as a teaching which was valid for all times to come. It was given for certain people. The message of a prophet used to be a certain tribe, a certain group of people, certain locality, are limited to certain times. It was first time in Islam that openly it is declared that this is one message which is for all people and for all times. People may agree with that or not, that's a different thing. But I'm saying what the books say, what the guidance says. It was limited to certain people sometime. It was open to all the world at this time. So in this way, I mean the points of difference is there. But having said all that, I would say that these are the things which can be discussed easily. Because basic thing taught in all religion is that we must be willing to listen to other people. And we must be able to sit together happily and in a very friendly atmosphere, in a nice way, without picking up any fight or difference or anything. I mean, I can present my point of view, you can present your point of view, and both should be happy. I mean, everybody has the full right to have one's own opinion and to continue having that one. Nobody can pressurize. There is no compulsion in matters of religion. That is what Islam teaches us. But that invites our attention that followers of different religions, I mean, they should be open to one another. They should come together, they should sit together, discuss the matters, and they should read the books. For example, I can tell you that I read the Bible, I read the Bhagavad Gita, I uh, read sometimes the Buddhist scriptures. So these books are there, which occasionally I, I look and study them. Similarly, other people are also invited they should have a copy of the Holy Quran and study that one. So if we are open in that way, that all the guidance has come from God Almighty, we should read and find out, then of course the people will be able to become more friendly and without any you know, ill feeling between them, they will be able to share together 
and discuss together and live together happily. That's, I think, the ultimate objective uh, towards the establishment of a peaceful society that we have been talking this afternoon. Just add for just, just basically two minutes. A prophet is someone who in some instances foretells the future, but mainly it's foretelling God's will for people at a certain point in time. It's thrilling to read many of the prophets, way back, some of them 2,000 years, 3,000 years and more. And it definitely is the case that these were written by God through these, through these wonderful men of God to people at certain points in time. But what I can do in the year 2010 I can pick up these wonderful words of these people at like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Abraham, Isaac, many, many people like that, and I can say that is relevant to me and my situation in Go South in 2010. I can apply that there, and I get tremendous sort of truths. That I say, yes, it was so relevant then. God spoke to these people. But down through the centuries, talking to me. And therefore, I can apply that in my life. And I find that thrilling. I can share that. Thank you very much. So, okay, thank you very much. And uh, this is the end of the question answer session. I would uh, request uh, Mr. Kethi Karigi, MSP, to come for the vote of thanks. <coughs> Thank you very much and, and first of all I'm sure that the platform would want me to thank everyone for, for coming here uh, this evening um, and can I say that um, just prior to uh, commencing this afternoon uh, Jim uh, Hutchinson and I had a conversation about um, who was going to thank who in the vote of thanks um, I think uh, perhaps Jim had been doing pray prayers uh, during this this afternoon um, and prompted to get out of that particular uh, role. But we'll we'll see how we progress. And if I um, do it well enough, um, perhaps he will be able to um, sit at the top uh, table. Um, first of all, can I also ask for forgiveness if I um, get some of the pronunciations? Uh, wrong, um, just like Agta had said at the beginning about pronouncing my name, you'll you'll understand that I might uh, get some things wrong. So first of all, can I can I thank Agta for inviting me along and organising this event and for tapping so many doors uh, in the area to invite people along. And he started off of uh, today talking about peace, toler tolerance, love, and understanding. And I think that has been the theme from all of the speakers that we've had uh, this afternoon, and I, I thank him for organising it. Can I also thank um, Khalid and Brian for the translation of the, the Holy Quran, and I'm sure um, those of us who are, are not of the, the Muslim uh, faith found that very uh, interesting and meaningful. Um, the, our, our chair today, I think you have been a very fair uh, chair, offering and um, fairness to the, the, the speakers and uh, when we came to questioning ensure that everybody who had their hand on up and had something to say or ask uh, was was heard um, and now on to the to the main event and uh, our, our speakers um, Sandy uh, Meakin from the the Church of, of God reminded us all that we were uh, in the Christian faith we're all one in the eyes of, of Jesus Christ and that through our faith we can bring hope and we can bring uh, love to to the world and and that really is the you know the starting block for uh, for Christianity um, in my opinion. Um, Sandy came all the way from uh, Belfast um, to get to to Kilsaif, um, but then when we go on to the Imam uh, Rashid and he's very welcome to Kilsaif. He's made a much longer journey to get here, uh, not just across the uh, the water, but you know, really interesting to hear that the um, the life that you've you've led, studying in, in in Pakistan and then to London and Japan and back to London, and here we are in Kilsaif, and we are very welcome uh, here the, the this evening. And the Imam um, mentioned that uh, men had been advocating you. I think so it took us back to the the theme the role of women in a peaceful society. Um, and he said that men had been had been advocating the rights of, of, of women. And, and that's true, because 
in politics um, and in, in, in religion, um, it's it's men who who, who lead the, the the way there. And if it hadn't been for uh, enlightened men, um, seeing that all of us women had, as as the lady at the front there um, had said, we had a, an equal uh, role to play. Well, perhaps um, someone like me might not be standing um, in a platform here as a, a, an elected uh, politician. Um, so um, we're, we're, we're grateful uh, for that. Um, but I, I do, uh, you know, one area where I would perhaps uh, disagree that, that men still are dominant in, in politics, men are still uh, dominant in uh, religion, but we're all equal in faith. Um, and men and women all have uh, all have a faith. So I do think there's perhaps a balance there when we look at some of the um, scriptures uh, uh, going back that we can uh, we, we we can take. Um, so we, as I said, we started off saying we had peace, tolerance, love, and understanding. And every one of our uh, speakers spoke about that. The airman spoke about peace will be everywhere all over the world. When you look at the, 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 the similarities between our two religions, and you know, I have to declare I'm a, a, a Christian, but when you look at the similarities between um, our two religions, when you look at where they're, they're practiced over the, the world, we must surely be um, a, a, a force within uh, the world. Um, and we look forward with hope, because with that force, hopefully, um, uh, uh, in, in the future, we can see a much more uh, peaceful world. And as the airman told us that um, while women are involved in all different aspects of, um, of life now, whether they be doctors, whether they be lawyers, whether they be, be, be um, uh, 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 carers at, at home, but women can make a huge difference to um, the, the peace and our future. Because uh, as Emma had pointed out, that women um, are the primary uh, are the primary carers, and you know, regardless of what job you do, I think in the future we always still will be. Um, so we can shape the the lives, we can shape the minds of young men and young women, and hopefully make them uh, better citizens of their community, their town, and the the wild, wider world. So, on behalf of the people of Pulside. I'd like to thank everyone, all the sound technicians, are too, too many to, um, to, to go through, but everybody who's made this peace conference uh, possible, um, and especially to a very distinguished guest at the uh, talk table, and thanks for answering all our thank questions. You. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I would request uh, Mr. Jim Hutchison, please come in to a word of thanks. Some years ago, I was appointed as rector or head teacher of Denny High School, just a few miles from here. One of my tasks was every morning I had to read out announcements of what was happening in the school. And this particular morning, I had a big list of, of all the announcements, the, the results of the school football teams and hockey teams and different events that were on. And then I came to a sheet and I started reading the names. And every single name on it was all the people from the school, about 50 of them, who came from their background was from different ethnic minorities. There was people from Pakistan, from China, from Poland, from every. And I started reading these, and I could hear the laughter coming from all over the school at my attempt to try and pronounce these names. So I was so glad that Cathy helped me out there, because I was in total humiliation uh, for weeks, and all the teachers outside were laughing at me trying to announce all these names. They played a trick on me, actually, but uh, I fell for it. We have a wonderful uh, motto in this town. It's in Latin for those who are Latin scholars. I only did that many, many years ago. Spi expectamus. We look forward with hope and expectation. And I think the wonderful thing about this is that we have got to come out of our own little corners, share our faiths, share what we believe, work together in our communities so that we understand each other, we work together, in the Christian faith that I've been brought up in, I've seen over my lifetime, and certainly back from my parents' and grandparents' lifetime, 
different interpretation is developing and just, just in how we've operated our faith. It's still the same faith. Still very much the same faith, but there's different interpretations. I've had the privilege of being head teacher of three schools in the last 20 years in Falkirk, and I had many, many people who were from an Islamic background. But the exciting thing to me was, in none of these schools did I see these young people just staying around with all the groups from their own ethnic background. They went around the schools with their pals and other classes, girls, boys, many of the, this is a bit particularly about girls in this conference, many of these young women went on to be doctors, lawyers, extremely important jobs, were terrific people. The exciting thing would be I would go along the corridor at lunchtime and there they would be standing with their pals whose family had come from Scotland. And th 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 this happened right through. And even through the traumatic time, I remember the day when the 9-11 catastrophe took place. I was in the school and I heard it unfolding in my office. We had no, no problems whatsoever with any young people in the school without that. That was their friends and their pals. And I think the great thing is, as people come in from other countries, and Scots people go out to other countries, we begin to, uh, the Scots people, but proud of our traditions in Pakistan or India or China. And I had great grandparents and families who went to America. They're now Americans, 89 years ago, but are proud of the Scottish heritage. So we've got people who are growing up from different backgrounds, but we're part of Scotland, the barrack of sight. We're sharing our faith. And I think the tremendous thing is that if we understand where we're coming from, we can work together. We don't necessarily agree on everything, our differences, but we can share our, our faith, we can share our backgrounds, and we can be part of a community that's strong. There are extremists in every community. We've had people coming in over the centuries to this country and their contentions and so forth. But we've absorbed the groups of people. They've become Scottish, proud of their heritage, but very much proud of the Scots or British. And that's what we're aiming for, the people proud to be Scottish, to be British, bring their heritage here, listen to each other, sharing our common <coughs> elements of faith, discussing things we don't feel the same. I'll always be a proud Christian. I'll always, and I respect people who are proud of their faith. So it's been a thrill to be able to have this meeting here. Tremendous work done by... Mr. Abdul Khan and uh, Dr. Atu Khalid coming here, coming to Community Council, going to various other groups, been smashing to see the work we've done. And Sandy McMeekin coming to speak, and thrilled to meet yourself, share some thoughts at the back there, and all the other people from the Muslim Association. It's been terrific to take the effort. Keep up the good work. Let's keep talking. Let's keep praying. Let's keep sharing our faith in the one God. <laughs> Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the ever merciful. On the behalf of Majlis Ansarullah UK, I am very, very thankful to the people of this village. You have encouraged us by very good attendance, and uh, you have helped us to create more harmony in the society. I also appreciate uh, my organization and the organizers and that they have done very hard work. And as a tradition, we close our sessions by the silent prayer. And before that, I just want to let you know that if you need more information about our community, you can log in on the computer islam.org. If you type these words in Google search, the first website will you will see on the screen is our website. And you can find uh, many, many questions answered there in the media form and in the uh, written shape. And over channel, you can see on the sky is MTA 787. So I will request Imam Saab to lead us silent prayer, but it is absolutely up to you. If you want to join with us, it is up to you. If you remain seated as silent, it is up to you or you can pray on your own way. So I request Imam Sir to lead us. Okay, sir. let's uh, conclude the session with a prayer.
Amen. This is our motto that uh, you have uh, been able to bring the people of the own village here. These are not imported people. All people are from this uh, particular this village, and uh, inviting uh, their people to for onsen. This has created a more harmony in this village, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. It has been an absolute pleasure attending this peace conference today. I, am, I, I, I would never have thought I, that, that, that there would be so much clarity involved in it, and. Um, it's, there's so much similarities in, in all uh, different religions and um, the, the idea of, of, of peace and community and togetherness was, was explained very well and, um, and, and, and having been here with, with a group of, um, of new friends and um, I hope to be uh, new friends and in contact with everyone, uh, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure attending here and it's, it's, it's been really good to see such a good turnout today as well. So Thank you very much. Good. Thank you very much. My name is Kenneth McKeown and uh, I've listened to what uh, both you, you had to say here in your views of the Islam. Uh, I'm a member of Church of God. Um, it has been some points of views I've found with quite confusion. Uh, because uh, it's perhaps because uh, I've been brought up a Catholic. And, uh, I became a Christian some uh, 10, 12 years ago. Uh, I, my life at that time, uh, before I became a Christian, I was a user of drugs, drink, uh, a compulsive addiction. So a lot of problems. So you changed so everything. I have. I've taken possibly everything. Uh, coming to know Jesus as a savior and as my Lord uh, has transformed and changed my life. But uh, listen to the point of view of. Uh, your speaker, your main speaker today, uh, from the Islam point of view, I got I got quite a lot out of it, and uh, yeah, um, I, I thought I thought it was quite interesting. I thought it was quite interesting, and um, some of these views I agreed with, and some of these views I disagreed with. But we agree to disagree. We have to disagree. To, yes, we have to agree to disagree, which is that's true. But uh, other than that, uh, the conference I, I quite enjoyed it. Very, I very, very enjoyed it. I'm very, I'm very thankful to be here. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very you. much. No problem. Well, I would say that uh, by the grace of Allah, the conference was uh, quite uh, well attended, and uh, I think uh, everyone uh, very actively took part in it. So the difference I feel the the, the crowd here was that this time I feel the all the participants they were very open and uh, forthcoming and during the question answer session also we felt that they were asking very direct open questions and fully participating in it so that's a very good sign and that shows that the people here in this uh, Kilsyth village they are open-minded people they want to listen they want to share they want to talk about certain things and that is a very good spirit. As a matter of fact, the whole thing, as I have been mentioning, is that all the people, irrespective of whatever religion they believe, they have to be forthcoming, they should meet the people, they should share their views, and they should be open to even some criticism if it comes. But they have to take it in a very good spirit, without any bad feelings, they should be able to share and to tell other people and to learn from one another. This is the way forward, and that we have to do. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mary and I came to the conference this afternoon out of curiosity. I wanted to find out just what it was all about. We had the invitation round the doors but we also had an invitation at church uh, and I wanted to come and support Sandy and I really have enjoyed this afternoon immensely. It was good to hear the two different uh, ways, the Christian way and the Muslim way and it's been so interesting and I hope we can continue to talk because when people talk then we don't seem to judge each other. And right a wee quote this afternoon, the people that judge have less time to love and I thought that was a really good quote for this afternoon and so if we don't judge each other and we just love each other I'm sure we'll progress and we'll go on an awful lot better under our God. Uh, who's in charge of each and every one of us. Well, it's been a pleasure for me to come to the conference. Uh, my name is Jim Hutchison, as you know, and I'm involved with the Community Council in Corsyth. I was formerly head teacher in schools in Falkirk. 
And I think it's a terrific thing to be able to bring groups of people together from different backgrounds, different religions, different coming initially from different countries and sharing experiences. Because that's the way we begin to build really good community relations. And so it's been a lot of work for you and your friends, but it's and often difficult because there's misunderstandings between groups because we don't know what each other believe too much. But I think it's been a very, very worthwhile exercise. Thank you very much. If you want to say how, how the atmosphere here and do you like the food? <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's very, I'm enjoying the food. I'm halfway through eating the food before I'm speaking to you here now, but it's very, very nice. It's a big effort and it's terrific. You know, the man came all the way from London, very respectful, he's got coming and sharing his views. And then Pastor McMeekin, who's been over here from Ireland over the last few years, he shared. It was great to see different people coming and just sharing their, their faith, sharing their thoughts. And I think that builds understanding. So the more, the more that we can do at all levels, I believe we can really be, we can make a big difference. Thank you very much. I wanted to come in and listen to what was being said. You know, you you just want to hear what's going on and to mix in with the community. We've got to mix with each other, you know. We're all the same. And we've got to mix with each other. And the food is good. The food is great. Okay. Rajim, Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. I think first of all, I would like to congratulate the organizers. Uh, that uh, they organized this wonderful conference today and by the grace of Allah looking at the attendance that uh, majority of the people we can say that 99 percent of the guests they were from Kilsai village and that is a very good sign that uh, uh, the pe peoples of uh, this area they really uh, appreciated, appreciated our effort and also the invitation we extended to them that they have cooperated with us and they have accepted that invitation. The second thing which I would like to say that, you know, Dr. Savan, we came here first time in connection with visiting some of the churches. So it was our desire that we should have a conference here. So I think today by the grace of Allah, God have fulfilled this our desire. And we hope that members of Majlis and Sarullah will organize uh, similar programs maybe in a better way or we can say that uh, in a large on a large scale to give message of peace to more people of uh, this village and uh, by this mutual understanding to each other inshallah I think that uh, we will be able to achieve our objective the objective is that love for all hated for none and that uh, we should uh, stay in this society, we should stay in this country as one society. And this is, I think, our message which we are extended to the people. And uh, accepting the religion, any religion is a, a personal uh, action of a person or behavior of a person. But uh, giving the message of peace, it is our duty which we are doing. And I think I again congratulate you and your team. Uh, having done this very wonderful job and having done this very wonderful event uh, and uh, organizing it very well. I think the questions went very well and uh, Alhamdulillah both the speakers and uh, respected imams have uh, answered these questions uh, accurately and uh, uh, with full spirit and I feel that uh, the members of uh, Kilsaith village, those who came here, they will extend this uh, these information, they will share these information with their friends, with their colleagues, and through that, inshallah, I believe that the message will reach to the more people. Thank you very much. Imam Hari Dempsey, I'm a native of Kilsaith, very happily, a Christian, a Catholic Christian, and I enjoyed the meeting very much, very good. And I really do believe that uh, the more we look to each other in the hand of friendship, and uh, we will come to know that the one true. God, Allah, the Lord, we call him God the Father, God the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Holy the Spirit of God will lead us all to further knowledge, further enlightenment of the real truth, and the real truth is God. You know, that was a very enjoyable, you know, very enjoyable. Well, well, thank you very much for organizing this um, conference in Kilsyth. I'm glad you came here, and uh, it's just been so nice. I listened very intently to your speakers and 
because you had come to our community council meetings, I looked up um, on a website, the BBC website it was, about um, your faith, and there was nothing I disagreed with, yes. actually. And, and I also think, um, I think I think maybe we we want to get a kind of blend of the two of them. For example, as regards um, punish, punishment, I would say that um, Western society, Western religions, have become too forgiving. There are too many excuses. People should be forgiven for one or two offences, um, but then there are too many uh, people saying, oh, he did this because of that, because of this, because of the next thing. And I like the firmness of the Muslim faith. I mean, I think people should should be punished, literally punished, and the world would be a better place. Um, other than that, we really, we're all the same at heart, aren't we? We've all got the same fears and hopes and joys and so on. And it's been just lovely to meet all of you people and, and to listen to you.